Um, hello, it's from me, um, Nicholas and me, we are from the uh, data team at Doodle. We decided to share this talk also because I have such a boring voice that no one can endure it for more than 10 minutes. Um, so um, you probably, or many of you probably know Doodle. Uh, we are a kind of a scheduling platform. So whenever someone tries to bring people together for a meeting, a barbecue, baby shower or so, we try to um, bring tools to that people so that they can easily find the perfect date that fits most or even all of their participants. And the first product that Doodle, that actually defined Doodle was the Doodle, the, the Doodle poll, where you could just, um, as an organizer for an event, just uh, propose a bunch of time slots and then um, invite some participants and they can vote on those time slots. And hopefully um, it, there would be a kind of an anonymous vote on one time slot, which then wins. Otherwise you can just choose the, the, the one that gets the most votes. And that also was a, already was a big step forward from the usual email ping pong, where you just send a bunch of, of invitations out to people and then someone says, ah, I can't make it on that day. And then you uh, send a new invitation with a, with a changed uh, date and so on. And there was this kind of this loop that for some meetings kept on going. And this, this doodle poll eliminated many of those cases, but still the problem is that the organizer is not omniscient. So he doesn't necessarily know for each participant what the availabilities are and what the preferences are and so on. And that might still lead to some, to the best option, actually not being kind of in the voting process because the organizer didn't come up with it. And uh, this is especially kind of a problem as Doodle is now transitioning from a free product to more and more a subscription-based business. So we try to bring scheduling tools um, to a uh, um, paying audience, such as uh, so big corporations, basically. And uh, they, they want to schedule or they want effective tools to remove all this kind of uh, scheduling hassles, kind of these, these, these loops that we just talked about. So they just want uh, a very, very easy way to schedule their meetings. And one idea th that we had was to kind of provide them with a helper tool. Um, not an assistant that does everything automatically, books the meeting, but really a helper tool that kind of finds, given certain parameters, the best times to meet for a bunch of participants and suggests those times to be included in the, in the poll, basically. And um, so the, the question for us was then, what actually, what should the system suggest? What are good times? So basically, in our ideas, a good time is when the organizer would actually accept it into the poll and people would vote on it. So that easy as that, I guess. But the problem is that Doodle has very, very varied user base. So there's 10,000s of use cases. I mean, it really goes from, from board meetings to baby showers and D Dungeons and Dragon sessions. So it, it was never clear so how to bring all of these together in one system in a, as a kind of for a proof of concept that, that was too complex for us. So we just decided to segment our users and just say, okay, we pick randomly one user group, which is the paying customers, the, the premium customers, which are surprisingly homogeneous, I would say. And um, then the idea was to, to kind of build a system for them. The problem is that the, the premium business is not very, not very old at Doodle, so we don't have a lot of history on the customers. So we needed to actually kind of do or kind of learn from strongly aggregated data and find some good features in this, um, in this data, some very, very strong features where we can build simple models on top that uh, kind of um, give us an easy way to show to everyone that this is a good, good uh, use case and that users would actually like to have this. Because it could also be that it's complete failure. We bring it to production after, after a year and then users don't, don't need this kind of product. So um, yeah, that's uh, it's gone. So uh, yeah. So the, the first thing was to, to find relevant features. So what we did is we <laughs> went through, through all our history basically of, of polls and tried to find for this user base, try to find something that would already tell us up and kind of building this poll once you are in the, in the process of, of um, getting people to, to your poll and getting these, the, to uh, inviting them. Um, we wanted to know what already makes, uh, what, what features are really strong indicators for a time slot um, to be a good time slot, a bad time slot, so that people 
would not care about it or they would care about it a lot. So it, as it turns out, there are those strong signals. For example, we can already look at, uh, at the kind of partitioning of our data by time zone. It seems that different time zones have actually different scheduling behavior. So what you see here is just over the course of the day, um, the probability for three, uh, four or three, let's say, strongest time zones or countries, basically, um, that, uh, that an event in this, this group starts at the given time. So what we can see is that the, in the United States, well, Doodle has its kind of its largest subscription user base. Everything is kind of shifted to the to the early early not early morning but kind of the work day uh, work hours. And um, contrast to that, in Germany we have three strong peaks at breakfast, lunch, and uh, dinners. Everyone seems to be uh, caring only about meals. I don't know, <laughs> but the point is that already from this you can kind of get a strong hint in which direction you should go basically with your suggestions. Another strong feature is um, the, the free text that users enter. Because if you, if you create a doodle, you usually want your participants to know what this, this stuff is about um, so that they have some idea what they're actually voting on. And these, these titles and these descriptions, they um, kind of contain a surprising amount of information. So we built also a system, kind of a feature generator that would tell us for a given title what the most likely hours are, what the probabilities are that this uh, meeting or this event is scheduled at, um, at a certain time of the day. And these are some examples. So if you just, <laughs> they're kind of uh, chosen um, uh, with, with, or as obvious cases, but it's just really, you can put this title in and you would see that baby's breakfast, for example, would be predominantly, what a surprise, in the morning, whereas the movie night would be scheduled in, in the evening. and. There are other non, let's say, non-trivial cases where this signal holds as or holds as keeps on being very, very strong, and um, in conjunction with the work, uh, kind of this this graph that I showed before, the kind of the probability per time zone over the over the day, and several other features, we now can try to build. Um, or kind of uh, use very, very simple models on top of these features to. Uh, predict whether a given time slot would be a good time slot, basically. And the first thing that we did is kind of did a very, very naive approach because all our features are built kind of as probabilities. Um, we can just multiply them all and then have a final, final score for this, uh, for this time slot. It works surprisingly, surprisingly well and it's super cheap. It's super fast to compute. Another approach was to to um, actually use, for example, a random forest model on, on top of, uh, of these features to predict the probability that the time slot is good given these features. But for this, we had to actually gather data from the users. So um, we had to set up a system that each time someone creates a poll, we gather some, gather some information about, uh, about them, for example, the availabilities and so on, had to store this, and then kind of train a model on top. And what we did is we just checked whether you, uh, which time slots were added to the poll by the user without the, su the suggestion service being in, in, the, in the loop. So they actually manually um, added those slots. And we thought, okay, if they add them, they are probably good slots. So that's kind of the logic that we use to train a system. And this approach was very effective to train our infrastructure that Nicholas will, will talk about. Um, but it had several issues. For example, um, so it was never clear for us how good this proxy would actually be. For example, we would, we would find that kind of the most important feature that everyone thinks about, availability, was actually kind of irrelevant in our, in our data. So users would schedule meetings or would kind of propose times where they were not free according to their Google Calendar. And that meant that the model would kind of disregard this feature completely. So we, we were not, we thought this could not be. So we went into detail and saw, okay, this is actually most of the time a blocker that they set up for this meeting so that no one would overbook it. But um, yeah, so this is, this was only known until we kind of, uh, the, when we 
dove deeper into this whole thing. Um, but there were several other issues. For example, that we could not measure the poor success because there was no voting in our kind of back testing happening. So what we thought is, okay, now we have to go live with this system. We, we can't, let's say, train in this in our lab anymore. We just really have to see how the users interact. So we brought this all together and set it up um, so that users could actually interact with this. But our fir before we went live really to production, we performed some user tests and really found, already found that this was basically um, not very usable for, for many users because uh, there were the results were kind of, although statistically they made sense, but for the indiv individual users, they were kind of uncanny, they didn't like it. So we added uh, some small filters on top to tune this a bit more to actually be able to now really go live and we performed a, a silent lunch, a launch. And uh, what we did is we just used the, the simplest model that I talked about, uh, just the multiplication of the features to generate a score, which is called uh, a brown, brown scheduler and then the, the, what, that you can see in blue. And then we had the another model that was actually trained on our backtesting data, data and we checked how likely it was that users actually accepted the suggestions that we made. And uh, the test is actually quite recently, we just started a few weeks ago. And what you can see is that between those models, there seems to be a significant difference. And the trained model in orange on the left side is, I would say, up to now, uh, significantly better. The problem is that this is, as I said, it's not just relevant that users accept the suggestions, but also the participants, the people they invite, they should vote successfully on those suggestions. And what we see is when we go to the right side, where it's basically the, the probability that our suggestions receive votes from the, from the participants. This is what's plotted over there. This kind of positive signal on the left side kind of reverts. So now the, the two systems or the system that was better before is now worse. And even the even bigger problem is that manual slots, slots that were added by the user without our suggestions, without our service, they perform better. So we clearly still have a long way to go. What we know is that users actually want this because many, many people click on these, these suggestions, click on this button, although this feature was never, never kind of made public. So, um, we are now planning to kind of add some things to actually improve this. So what we want to do is we want to kind of personalize, look at your personal history, uh, your personal uh, scheduling history, and also using kind of your interactions with others. So when there's a meeting that you kind of booked very often with a certain person, so kind of this, this these user pairs, then yeah, probably you want to have a certain pattern also for your next meeting with, with this person there. And also, as I said, we had all these pre-built features that are kind of um, always computed uh, in a batch mode. Uh, what we want to change is we want to now go to a more, let's say, end-to-end -end approach using some neural nets, which are kind of successful at the moment, where those features are not pre-built anymore, but kind of figured out by the, by the net themselves, by the model themselves. And, uh, but Nicholas will talk about the kind of technical details a bit more. All right, um, yeah, let me just share a couple of kind of interesting aspects on, on the architecture itself. Um, this is a very high level view, um, shows like an entry point wherever like requests for suggestions come in. Um, then what we really wanted to have is, is a couple of models. Um, they would all run and, and kind of respond in real time. Um, we distinguish between live models and standby models. Um, we're saying live models are part of an experiment and standby models, we run them in real time and, and provide suggestions, but we just collect them, right? And a user will never see those. Um, yeah, and, and, and the live models, they, they always respond to the user in, in real time. Um, when you look at this, what's, what's also really important for us, it's kind of understand what's going on. Like it, it, doesn't need to be in, in very real time. Like we, we don't need to know like uh, an experiment is, is really bad for the last five minutes, but, but we should definitely know like when we started an experiment yesterday, we, we want to know today like how bad or how good is it performing. Um, for this to work, we like to this architecture, we added two more layers um, so that we collect everything that 
comes into our system as a request. Um, and we actually need to add kind of dynamic features into it as well. Like let's say let's say we talk about availability of people, right? If you if you ask Google Calendar today for for tomorrow, like how busy is this user tomorrow, um, it will give you a different result when you ask again tomorrow, right? So we need to we need to store this somewhere. Um, also, we need to collect all the all the results that we deliver to the users, and then kind of this is kind of a front end addition that like each client that asks for suggestions. Um, we we'll need to send us signals at the end, kind of like this suggestion was chosen, this one was was added, but then removed again, or people actually voted on 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 this suggested time time slot. Um, we also built a distribution service in front of these these models running in parallel. Um, it's basically like an API, so that we can integrate somewhat flexible into into different products. Um, and also it collects these dynamic features that we actually like we need to store them if if you want to retrain on this data or yeah. Um, and also it, it manages experiments. So when we say manage experiments, it's it's quite simple for now. We can we can just say we have two life models, they run 50-50. Or we have three life models and distribute it differently. Um, what it does as well, it, it kind of keeps track which users saw suggestions from which model. Um, just kind of like the sticky sessions, um, just just because kind of deliver a certain a certain kind of consistency, right? Like it, it could always be the the model that is performing worse, but at least it kind of gives you back the same thing, at least for the same day. Like when you come back the next day, we might give you different um, suggestions. All right. So we have this kind of flexible setup. We have a suggestion service. It has an API. We, we can run different experiments. And, and now it's really like we have a hammer, and, and we're really looking on, on, on where to integrate it. Um, so this is the standard use case. So this is doodle.com um, creating a poll. And then there's this green button, at time suggestions, where we just say, like, these are the best slots, um, according to our knowledge. Um, this is also what we trained for, so we kind of like the, the goal of, of the suggestion service or of our training was to, to give you options. Um, we're also prototyping something we call just book it. Um, so in case you have more knowledge about, let's say, let's say you already know, like all people can make it. And yeah, so this, this is kind of a prototype, so I ask, I asked to meet Henrik tomorrow for, or next week was it? Yeah, next week, to talk about the, the architecture and then it gives me a couple of options. And now I already know like two out of two can make it and, and first day 10 sounds reasonable. Like why not just book it and sync it into the calendars? So instead of polling, uh, we just present options and then you say, okay, let's, let's invite this other pe person. Um, what's next? What's, what turned out to be <laughs> rather a, a big topic itself is, is kind of explaining these suggestions to users. So these are two mocks that we show to users. Um, the one to the right is, is probably easier to explain. So if, if you look at these blue slots and it says one out of five are free, right? It's, it's one reasonable explanation for a suggestion. Um, but then people would actually ask us like, if only one person is available, like, why would you suggest it? <laughs> like, even, even though it might be the best, the best option. And on the left, you see another explanation where we say, these are the features we, we included. So availability um, could be the title, personal preference, and so on. And I, I guess what's, what's, really, what's really interesting here is, is kind of if you provide a good suggestion, nobody asks for an explanation. But then if you, if you if, let's say you suggest a slot in the middle of the night, and then people would think like, why would he do this? Like, what's, what's wrong with the system? But it might be that two people are in different time zones and it's, it's actually reasonable. Um, yeah. Also, 
what we're also trying to figure out currently is kind of like how how can we further improve the the workflows that you have in Doodle and and kind of integrate it better into products. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>